I'll moderate the panel. I'm Sharon Green. I co-chair the um, APTA Intercity and High Speed Rail Financing Subcommittee. And I also chair <laughs> APTA's P3 committee. Um, we have three panelists with us today. And one of them is uh, in the equity side of the picture, meaning collecting private equity for investment in projects. And two speakers are from uh, the finance or banking community, which also takes an active role in investing in projects. And so uh, our speakers today are John Morton, Investment Principal of Global Infrastructure Partners. And um, uh, the bios are in the program. I'll just give a very short bio, but John is the Investment Principal at Global Infrastructure Partners. Um, he has been uh, focused on investment in strategic infrastructure projects um, across North America, South America, and Europe for over 13 years. And they include some very large projects, including high-speed rail in Italy, Gatwick Airport, um, Port of Brisbane, Terminal Investment Limited, London City Inn Airport. And I think that what you'll see is in the bios from each of our speakers, uh, they have played a role in financing intercity rail, high-speed rail, um, as well as other forms of infrastructure. Um, so that is a common feature in their bios. Um, our next speaker after John will be Ron Marino. And Ron is a managing director of Municipal Securities Division of City Group, Corporate and Investment Bank. And uh, Ron has been with City for over 31 years in municipal and project finance. Uh, he had previously been a deputy commissioner in the Department of Housing, Preservation, and Development under Mayor Koch in New York. Um, again, this uh, in this in a role in multiple types of projects from transit, seaports, toll roads, highway revenue bonds, uh, various forms of financing instruments from Garvey's bonds to GANs, TIFIA, RIF loans. Um, and have had a role in looking both on the federal side, looking at TIFIA and RIF. On, he's currently working on four different TIFIA RIF loans for clients that he would like to talk to us about, but won't be able to talk to us about uh, as he comments. So, um, and, then, <laughs> and then our third speaker is Ray DiPrincio. Ray is a co-head of Infrastructure Finance North America for Sumitomo Mutsui Banking Corporation, and he heads a team of bankers at SMBC responsible for originating financing and providing advisory services for a wide range of infrastructure projects. Over 30 years of experience, including um, large-scale projects like um, uh, the A25 toll bridge concession in Montreal, the uh, LAX Automated People Mover, uh, Long Beach Civic Center, um, State Street Indiana Redevelopment Project, Champlain Bridge, Ottawa Light Rail, and many, many more. Um, Ray has spent a lot of his time as an advisor to the USDOT TIFIA program office, arranging TIFIA financing. And um, also, he's very involved in the Advisory Board of Cornell University's Program on Infrastructure Policy, and I think that this has made a big impression on Ray in terms of what will happen on our last panel, which is the role of uh, young professionals in the industry, and the point of view is how do we cultivate uh, that kind of knowledge, and are we moving in the right direction. Our format for this panel is going to be that each of our speakers will first give a brief introduction about their involvement in financing infrastructure and transportation generally, and intercity and high-speed rail more specifically. And then we'll focus on some structured uh, discussion with three or four key questions. And after that, we'll take questions from the audience. And with that, I'll ask for uh, introduction from Ron. Thank you. Good afternoon. And I thank you for the invitation to come and speak to you. So I guess one of the topics that Sharon asked us to try to cover today was the ability for the private sector to actually try to finance high-speed rail or intercity rail, even if it's not 150 miles an hour or higher. Uh, and I would say that depending on traditional 
fundamental project finance principles. There is a real possibility that the private sector would finance very feasible routes for inner city rail, whether it be high speed or even somewhat lower speed. Um, I think there is one caveat to that, and we'll, we'll mention that at the end of my remarks. I think anytime you look at a project financing, right, you're going to look at some of the topics that the prior speakers covered this, this morning, and Dan just did during his speech this afternoon, which is, do you have strong origin and destination pairs, the cities, or a string of cities along the route, such as a New York or Boston to New York, to Philadelphia, to Wilmington, down to Baltimore and DC, where you do have a, a string of five or six major cities. Do you have a combination of both mandatory trips, those that relate to business or work, and discretionary trips, right? Those that maybe you don't or can't depend upon every single day to take that train, but will take it with some level of regularity, whether it's for recreational or non-recreational purposes. Do you have competing types of modes that are at levels of congestion that affect efficient use of those other modes, right? And in the I-95 corridor, right, we know that levels of congestion on I-95 or in the 405 corridor in California or other areas of the country. And we know it's pretty tough to really be able to fit any additional airplanes into a number of airports at the peak periods. In the off peaks you might, but in the peaks it's very difficult. And do you have a population that is sufficiently affluent enough who might be able to afford this type of transportation, which will probably price out at somewhere around that airport economy or business, potentially business fare on a, on a competing air alternative. Um, I think most drivers really do not recognize that the IRS is willing to repay a corporation at 54 cents a mile for the use of their vehicle. Most drivers, I think, look at the fuel cost as the total cost and don't really recognize the cost of insurance, depreciation, perhaps lost time. So sometimes I think it's very hard to translate from the car unless the fare is going to be exceptionally competitive in the intercity rail. So I think if you have those factors, I think you do have an opportunity to try to get John to come in and maybe offer you some of that equity where they might be looking at a return, right? somewhere between 12 and 16% in most probability. And to do that, if you're, lucky. if you're lucky, you're right. And to do that, you're going to have to be able to create a stack of debt, huh? Because you can't do this all with equity because the prices would be beyond anyone's ability to afford um, a trip. So you're going to have to look for a stack of debt. And that's where guys like I come in, right? I am a merchant of debt. That's my job, right? I work with cities, <laughs> states, authorities, federal government on different ways to utilize, utilize debt. And the one caveat I wanted to mention to you is this. I don't think there's any project in the United States that can be done 100% from private sources, OK? I think any project, no matter how strong the origin and destination cities, no matter how congested the roads are, no matter, no matter how good your feasibility study is, because it's going to be very hard to get investment grade ratings on all of the debt that might comprise your whole capital stack. And so you're probably going to have to visit the USDOT and look at the TIFIA and or RIF program or some combination of both. And there, you're going to be able to get, you know, borrow from the federal government, which is the only natural AAA in the world, S&P has downgraded it to AA, to AA plus, but still the most natural AAA. And a 30-year treasury today is about 332. If you were going to go into the capital markets, whether it be taxable or tax exempt, 
you're going to be borrowing at five or six hundred basis points or five to six percent higher than that treasury. That would probably make your project unaffordable. Okay? So the caveat is yes, you can bring in private equity for, I think, a significant percentage, maybe 25%, maybe 30% of the project. But in the end, I think you're going to have to visit USDOT, where I would call the TIFIA and RIF program a very significant subsidy. It's not an operating subsidy. It's not a direct capital subsidy coming from a sovereign or from a state or from a city <coughs> or from some combination thereof, but it is a significant subsidy. Thank you, Ron. Um, merchant of debt. It's my job. Merchant Very. <laughs> should put it on your resume. That's an interesting new title. Okay, John. Okay. Your Look, introductory comments. Yeah. Um, I'm very glad to be here. One of the things that we'll get to straight away is we have written a check. Yeah. We have written a check for two billion euros into high speed rail. This year we invested in NTV Italo in Italy. It's the first open access inner city rail link that's, that's ever been bought privately, right? Most of them are either run under a spe specified concession or government owned around the world, right? We serve 19 cities, 72 daily trains, right? And that's going to grow. What I would say about investing in high speed rail is there is a lot of appetite to take risk, but only risks that we can absorb, right? And when you think about the previous speaker and what he's mentioned here, is there is a lot that we can do, but there's a big misconception for equity risk. And the big misconception I hear in the US, which I didn't find as much in Europe, is this conception that if something has an element of government, government subsidy or government low cost debt, or other programs, and I don't care about the plethora of programs in the US, none of that benefits the private sector because I pay full price for my investment. If, if there's a bigger subsidy to what goes in there, I will pay a higher price to enter into it. I have a target return on behalf of pensions from around the world. What comes down to in high-speed rail, which is different than a lot of other sectors, is imagine if you were going to launch an airline. And for that airline, you were going to do the city pair of LA to San Francisco. And before you launch the first service, you're going to pay 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 billion for the right for that service. And if after two years it doesn't work, you're still out that money. This is the challenge of high-speed rail. It becomes very much a policy decision. And that policy decision can, be, can be benefit a whole host of things, whether it's, it's use of the, the Fresno Valley, or, or it's um, green, or it's a whole host of other items that are relevant to government decision making. When it comes down to the pricing, it's an impossible punt that someone could do in the private sector. Because remember, an airline flies 150, 170 passengers, depending on the size of the airplane, can be more. Each train is going to do somewhere 200, 250 passengers. So it's very analogous to trying to run an airline, but you have to invest everything. You're all in. All your chips are on the table. And if those passengers don't show up, there's an issue, right? That's what puts that risk beyond the private sector walking in and doing the whole thing without anybody else coming in. When it comes down the line, the reason we've invested in high-speed rail in Europe is it's almost a 60-year project in Europe of building the infrastructure. Now that it's been set up, a regulatory framework has been put in place where we, get, we pay an access charge to put our train on the rails. That access charge is non-discriminatory, which means the other rails that run on it pay the same price we do, whether it's the government, it's another op operator, or ourselves. Even with that, Italo, before we bought it, started in 2006. It took six years to get enough regulatory approval to start running trains. It took another four years to be profitable. 
in that time it was restructured because the original plan was targeted too high a scale for the market that was there. It's been restructured and now quite a profitable and quite a growing business. But at some point, we can take that risk, but it has to be a risk I can identify and I can price. And I can take a differentiated view because there'll be a lot of investors who look at it. Because I take a differentiated view, I'm gonna fight with them and pay the highest price possible for them. And we're willing to do that, but at the moment in high speed rail, there's a lot of argument about whether or not there's this fantastic pool of money that's gonna take a risk that, into the wild unknown. The reality in the US is rail, rail itself, was launched on the back of government funding 100, 150 years ago because of the level of risk taken in what was done there, okay? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Sharon, and, um, and thanks, Ron and John, for, for those excellent remarks. Um, <clears throat> these are uh, a little hard to, uh, to come after um, these two speakers. Um, I, I don't think of myself as a merchant of debt, um, though that's probably a, a, a fair um, label in the sense that I, my career in project finance really came up on the debt side, first in, uh, in corporate banking and then in uh, public finance for a number of years and then in project finance. And, and that's uh, largely the role that I, I, I take now where we both provide advice as well as um, provide our own balance sheet as well as raise money in the institutional markets. So I come at these projects, um, I come at high speed rail, I should say, very much with a debt cap on, um, but also mindful of um, John's perspective um, and, and thinking about you know, what you really can um, and can't do from an equity chair versus a debt chair. Um, you know, non-recourse financing is, is very un, unforgiving. And I think in general, as we think about high-speed rail, and, and I, I think, John, maybe this is the points that you were sort of getting at in your, in your remarks, you know, there's, there's only a certain amount of um, capital that the debt investor is willing to put into a project like this. And, it's, and frankly, it's a very limited pool of money when you really look at all of the aspects that Ron um, had outlined quite rightly in terms of how, in effect, a debt investor is going to analyze really what the capacity of a given project might be um, in order to put debt um, on it. And you know, you look at Brightline as an example. Um, Brightline, very, very successful was able to raise $600 million. But when you look at the, the nuts and bolts of the financing, it took um, essentially 0.74%, I think is what Fitch had um, published in its report of market share in order to raise $600 million and come in at a triple B minus rating. Now, you can argue whether that was right or wrong, but it, I think it's a, it's a, ca a, a classic you know, case study example of the limitation of what the debt capital markets are able to do in terms of providing debt capital against ridership risk, as we really think about it. Um, equity is obviously able to look at um, the upside and have a very long view associated with it. But at the end of the day, if we burden these projects with um, a debt profile that is unrealistic, equity is not ultimately going to come to the table because it, it just won't work and they ultimately will lose you know, their entire investment. Equity has unlimited upside, but also um, it has 100% of its, its dollars at risk. And, and to the extent that there is a debt component in that, in that project, the debt is obviously there um, and can ultimately foreclose on the equity's investment. So when you see equity come into these projects, I think what we all have to recognize is you know, we've, we've hit on all the key issues um, from this morning until where we are today, there, um, it's unrealistic, in effect, to think that private capital um, can finance from greenfield to operation um, a major high-speed rail investment. We have to really be thinking of this as a, as a partnership between um, private capital and public money that comes into it. And think of it in the context, really, of how much um, investment is really needed in order to get to the point where we have a realistic um, uh, pro forma that both debt and equity can look at. Equity can take the upside risk and, and um, the debt can look at it uh, from you know, a sort of a hard-nosed, non-recourse lender's viewpoint and be able to put 
real money on the table with the expectation of, of getting that money back within a, a certain amount of time, whether it's a 30-year financing or perhaps even longer. Um, when we look at the examples around the world, I, I spent a fair amount of time financing uh, rail projects in Canada. Um, Canada has uh, been very successful, albeit these are transit projects, but has been putting a lot of money um, to work in cities like Ottawa, um, Vancouver, and, uh, and Toronto as well, using the debt capital markets. But it's taking an approach where, in effect, it said, when we looked at the risk allocation, ridership risk is not something that um, the private sector is willing to take. So in effect, it uses um, the risk allocation model to take construction risk off the table. Private lenders are basically lending um, to build the project. But the operation of those projects, while done on a private basis, is against an availability payment. So they're not taking um, any fare box risk associated with that. But those are you know, quite successful. And there are a number of them, as we've indicated, as I've indicated, that are, that are ongoing and a, and a relatively bright future for the build out of the, uh, of the rail sector in Canada. So I think you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, it comes down to risk allocation. I think, Dan, um, you, were, you were spot on in terms of how you ca characterized it. You, you really have to look at um, where uh, where the risks are and, and which parties are best able to absorb the risks that you're willing to take. And both equity and debt um, sources of funding are not going to step into a project where, um, in effect, they cannot quantify, manage, and, um, and ultimately absorb the risk profile of those projects. Thank you. Some interesting comments that don't even fit with the questions that I had uh, set out in advance. But uh, I think that the idea of the risk profile is definitely something that figures very heavily in all of these projects. And it's uh, for a project like Dan Richard was talking about, where the legislation requires that the project be 100% uh, non-subsidized by the government puts the project in a very difficult situation because even privately funded projects um, won't accept revenue risk. So if, if that's the case uh, for most projects, um, it's going to be very difficult. It is difficult for moving ahead with California high-speed rail with zero government subsidy. So yeah. L let me rephrase that because yeah. that's not true. I will take, I'll take revenue risk. I'm taking full take revenue. volume revenue risk in Italy. Okay. Have absolutely no problem. And, I had a struggle and, and, with it in inter or within a city, so public and, transportation. And if I'm not mistaken, you have a direct competitor. Yes. Frecciarossa yes. operates alongside of Italo along, in effect, the same corridor. Absolutely. So you, in effect, have a government provider of high-speed rail competing against you know, a red-blooded equity investor like Italo mm -hmm. running high-speed rail between Milan and Naples. Absolutely. So we're ready to take full volume risk uh -huh. on an inner city basis. Within a city, the challenge is multimodal, and it becomes, it becomes a formula of impossible to predict, right? So we're willing to take that risk. In California, what he described was he didn't have to get a return on his capital, but the operations themselves needed to be profitable. Mm -hmm. That is viable. That becomes um, that becomes a very complicated. I, I don't know if anyone knows the history of GIP, but we're, we were the we were launched many years ago, and we've moved past this history. But our history was a joint venture between Credit Suisse and General Electric. So we have a lot of process engineers, and we have a lot of financial guys. All right. So we look at every problem as an operational optimization, okay. and that's the way we take every investment. If you give me the tracks. I have an optimization of how many trains, when do those trains leave, maintenance of those trains, acquisition of those trains. And at the moment, in Italy, relative to our competitor on the same lines, we have 30% we have lower cost of trains, 30% lower cost of maintenance, and 30% lower cost of personnel. It's a little unfair relative to a government because a lot of times governments have obligations to serve certain communities that are out, our policy obligations were just delivering for the public. But because of that, we actually deliver a price that's 20% lower than the incumbent, as well as less than half the cost of an airline flight in those similar routes. Because of that, it's not only a relatively 
you know, high quality experience, but it is also an economical one. Economical. So as an operating unit, right. we're, we're very profitable, mm -hmm. right? And we paid for that in our investment, and we think we can make it even better and look across Europe. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's true across the US. What, what, what the big difference is, is if you, if you get down to a very simple unit level, we pay approximately six euros per, per kilometer on the track. It's a track axis. So each, a train crosses a kilometer, we pay approximately six euros. It, in, across Europe, it's anywhere from six to 12 euros. If, if you take the normal construction cost of high-speed rail in the US, anywhere from, I don't know, eight million to 30 million per mile, and you convert that at a cost of, 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 of um, you know, how much it costs per, per, you know, for investment, as well as you assume, call it 30 trains per day on that track, what would, what would the access charge have to be? And that access charge is anywhere from 30 to $100 per train. Relative to highways or anything else, it's, it's prohibitive as a total return. So when you build the capital and you put in place the infrastructure, then equity players like ourselves can take big risk on it. But it's the infrastructure that's itself. John, would it be challenge. fair to say right. that if someone, right. say the federal government, did the forty billion dollars that Peter mentioned this morning, you would be interested in an operating loan? Absolutely, right. right? Absolutely, and we pay for a right to do that. It, right. It's and hard again, to I, separate I, out. Yeah. I, I got checkbooks, yeah. Yeah. No, that and that's the point I was getting at. No, that's the point I was getting at. I would bid for that, right? On the right? operating and I would side. take the operating risk, and I would bid for that, right? So mm -hmm. you would get a cost of capital that is reasonable at an equity level. Mm -hmm. And in exchange for that, I would be pressured to operate clean trains, or the whole host of things that would go. So I'm not getting a benefit. Mm -hmm. What it is, is I can't absorb the rest of that risk and still. Just the returns would be impossible. Right. 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 And, and so just to cut maybe through this a little bit differently, in effect, what I think we're, Ron and John and I are saying is you have to separate the, the private sector's investment in the capital cost of construction versus the cost of operation. Will equity and debt take um, operating risk and, in effect, um, pay for the operation of a, of a high-speed rail project on an intracity basis? you know, anywhere in the world that, as Ron put out, it makes, it makes sense. Yeah, that's absolutely the case. But the, the, the sheer cost of capital investment in getting those projects to the starting line, in addition to taking the operating exposure associated with operating that project, the two together doesn't really work. Mm -hmm. And that's where, and I, I think you made an interesting point, John, about how even subsidized debt, while 3% sounds really attractive or whatever the 30-year treasury is, you still have to overcome that amount of debt service before you get to the equity return. So it, it, it almost breaks the model, even if you're looking at you know, 2%, whatever, whatever the number might be. Again, I don't want to put words in your mouth. No, I think that's right. And, and look, I spent, I spent a decade in Europe. I worked as an advisor prior to being on the in the principal side. Um, I've privatized airports. I've privatized a whole host of things. When when you get down to it, the one thing that strikes me in the U.S. is there's a big argument about whether or not there should be more grants and subsidies or more tax benefit. In my mind, as an equity investor, I'm broadly indifferent because they're both subsidies. Right? How they come about. It's whether or not the structure of a project is investable. And can I identify and manage the risks that are going forward? One thing that, that I don't think has ever been really noted is when we did Italo, Italo has not taken very many cars off the road. It's taken some, but for the most part, we've taken out the airline, the, the air pair of the cities, right? Milan to Rome used to be something like 50% of the 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 trip the trips over there sure mm -hmm. sure no, yeah nobody, sure nobody percent currently mm -hmm. it's 15 or 15 or so currently rail is 70 percent of that route it's a relative option to air 
And in a lot of the cities in the US, if you look at LaGuardia's new project or any of these new projects, none of them are actually solving the problem US airports have in major modern problem cities, right? Right now, LaGuardia's doing $3 billion project. Five. Five. Delta. Oh, that's fair enough. Fair enough. Right? Delta. Right? Delta. Right? Delta. right? Delta. But, yeah. but the Not biggest problem at LaGuardia, the biggest problem at LaGuardia is delayed flights. Now you'll have a nice place to sit while you're waiting for your flight. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is, and, and uh -huh. no, I mean, it was needed, it's important, it's, you know, there's a, it's part of the solution. So it's like yeah. It's the same problem. Right. Yeah. You're going to have a nice place to sit while you're training. So, yeah, right. exactly. So right. one of the things that's, that's not really noted is that when it, Amtrak took a lot of the flights out of that sky, these airports would love to get the small, small city carriers. jump. Right out of there so they can take the long hauls into their airports. This is a real congestion problem. So it's not just that rail is a nice alternative. It is a relevant portion to the transportation networks of the US. That's what I said mm -hmm. earlier, right? Yeah. You need right. that congestion in the airports to make rail the real competitor for 300 miles or less. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of natural allies, other modes, and you can each optimize and rationalize because right. the more transcontinental flights you can bring into JFK or Newark or Logan or you know any higher those, revenue, they'd rather have those flights on the transcons. They make much more revenue per in-plane passenger than a shuttle flight. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, also I think those of us that have been looking at high speed for a long time. The paradigm used to be that the airlines were against it, and they were the, you know, business lobby that effectively um, kept high-speed rail from developing in the United States. Whether or not that's true, it's pretty clear right now that a route like Dallas to Houston is of very, very little interest to the airlines at this point. So that opposition, in effect, is off the table, and it's really now about making it work, and um, you know, putting in place whatever the whatever the infrastructure is that we need in order to do that. So. Okay, question for you. It's been quoted that there's plenty of private financing for projects. There just aren't a lot of good U.S. projects that have funding. Agree or disagree? Absolutely true. I, I, I mean, we, we, um, we have way too many conferences. We have more conferences than projects. We sure do. There's um, one right now <laughs> across the street. But no, and it, it, is a, it is a serious point. I mean, I think what... Um, what John represents quite rightly, and, and obviously Ron as well, um, the access to markets, um, the access to um, whether it's equity or debt, is it completely overwhelms the number of opportunities that are out there. And, and it, you know, in, in some respects, um, it has driven down um, equity returns to levels that, you know, frankly, make some of the money want to sit on the sidelines because it is really, um, it, it, it's a, um, a little bit of a, um, a feast versus famine kind of issue right now. So um, when we talk about funding, though, versus financing, as, as we said, there's lots of financing, but is there funding out there in the sense that is there um, a revenue profile that will drive a project um, towards, the, towards the financing finish line, if you want to call it? I mm -hmm. think that's a, that's a huge issue in, in the United States. And we've, um, we have... I think in, in many respects kind of talked ourselves out of whether it's user fees or taxes, you know, whatever it might be, there's a lot of political discourse that in effect says, well, no, it's all terrible. I just want, I just want it all and I, I really don't want to have to pay for it. I think in Texas there's, a, there's an opposition to user fees as a, essentially another form of taxation, which kind of drives, um, drives me crazy to, to hear stuff like that. So that, that, is, um, that, that is an issue, but I think you know, there are also signs where um, if you put a project out there that um, is well understood, is well marketed to the public sector, people will pay taxes. Local option taxes in California are a great example of how you can actually put a piece of legislation in front of voters that says this is what it's going to generate, this is what it's going to pay for, and, you know, they pass relative, and Sharon, you'd know this better than I would, mm -hmm. they pass relatively uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. Although it's interesting because all of the marketing for um, SB1, which was on the ballot in California and just uh, uh, was challenged to set back the gas tax increase and all of the motor vehicle fees, high-speed rail had to play a very funny role in it. Stepping back, it was not marketed as something that was going to provide any funding for high-speed rail, even though High-speed rail was going to get 
a, a very significant amount of funding from it. If you drove through the Central Valley, it's a it's a way to the train to nowhere again, and all of the sign the signage was very negative. It was presented as a highway safety measure. Well, it, because it you a, couldn't market high speed rail on the back I, of that. I also have to say, and I, I I'm uh, constantly um, you know going up against other bankers in the industry that look at high speed rail and you know start running and keep running. Um, mm -hmm. ca California high speed rail was just not very well understood. I, I was at a conference and uh, Jeff Morales finally explained it pretty clearly when he in effect said California has two economies and high speed rail is going to create a third economy. And finally I was able to, you know, look at someone and say, no, this is not about the alignment. You know, why why is it going to Bakersfield? Nobody really understood that, I think, in the larger um, universe of people trying to understand what, what high speed rail was doing in California. And I, Jeff, you were, you know, quite mm -hmm. succinct in basically saying, no, no, this is there, there's a third economy here that we're developing. That's really why we're doing this. And mm -hmm. Interesting because I was involved in uh, from the early on stage of shaping the high speed rail alignment and the political approaches that had to be unified within the Central Valley and Palmdale and Lancaster and the alignment was not selected to be the low cost alignment. It was selected to be the alignment that served the most places that were going to be important to pass the measure to fund it. And so um, there are a lot of compromises that have to be um, carved along the way. Sure. And th yet still holding something to the expectation that it's going to be a two-hour trip. Um, it's a visionary statement, but it also becomes an impossibility to meet when you have to uh, achieve changing the alignment, going on a faster uh, you know, something that can save you seconds or carve minutes out of the right of way because you have to meet the state legislative requirement is very costly. I have another question for you. Um, and I think Ron addressed this about the key criteria that you consider when you evaluate potential investments in uh, intercity and high speed rail. Are there particular attributes that you consider indicative on the positive and negative side? for US projects in particular and how they might compare to uh, international projects. And Ron went a long way to address that in his opening comments, what, what he's looking for. So John, Ron? Oh, sure. Yeah. 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 I'll put it in the context. I, I really like what the, the, you know, one of the things that's interesting with the Brightline guys have done is that I'm not sure and, and you know, I don't have any insight on this, but I'm not sure Brightline would be anywhere where it is if it didn't already own a freight railroad, right? Right. That's that's what we think. Yeah. Right. But maybe and it's not true. It's not something that's discussed. What it, makes it, it viable? It, you know, it, it started nearly right. ten years ago, right? The amount of effort to start pushing a ball like that, and the meandering element of because you remember, anything, you know, typically as an investment fund, we tend to, we stay away from roads anywhere in the world. We do mm -hmm. airports, ports, and railroads, mm -hmm. you know, until I buy a road. But, you know, that's another story, right? <laughs> uh -huh. But because it crosses so many jurisdictions, wherever you are in the world, and crosses so many interlacing approvals and issues, that it takes time, right? And that time is a big challenge to getting a return on investment, right? I think what... Just real quick, what, what's different about railroads versus a road? Probably that's why we don't do roads. What's different, well, what's different though? Because railroads cross the same, the same number of jurisdictions and counties. And it, it, I'm agreeing with that. That's the point I'm making is this is why a railroad is, oh, you mean as far as, because most of the railroads we invest in already exist or have an element of existing. So from a startup standpoint, as an investment thesis, to invest in a green field, because most roads you invest in are typically green fields, sometimes it's brown, right? Because that's usually the easiest way to push it through. Railroad is a new area where if you're doing a green field railroad, there's a lot of approval that needs to be done. And the biggest issue in the US is it's unclear the path of how you get there. If I'm in Europe, there's a pretty clear by country how regulation or how it's going to go through an approval path. 
So it can get done at least in a good estimated period of time. The biggest X factor that you typically find on a European standpoint is whether or not the land purchase has been accrued. And that's where the biggest amount of people get caught up. But aside from that, you know, it's, it's this interlacing regulatory problem, whether it's local, state, national, that, that overlaps. And that's, if there isn't a clarity on that and that's stamped in, I don't know how to go to first base on any mm -hmm. of these investments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, what I was yeah. talking about right. earlier was a greenfield, right? Not an established yeah. enterprise, right? So when you're looking at the feasibility study, the forecast, it's, that o, it's the O and D cities to make sure you have very strong city pairs or a number of cities along that alignment. It's to look at the types of trips, the mandatory business working person using that on a daily basis versus the discretionary trip that might be <laughs> recreational or maybe medical or whatever the reason might be. It's going to be the congestion factors, both on the roads and in the airports. And it's going to be, I think, also the level of affordability, both of the fare and then of the potential users. Do the, is there uh, an above average you know, wage within the general area, the general regional area, to be able to use it? And I think you know, it also goes to ease. I'll go back to what Mort said this morning about the entire trip. And I'll take my little trip this morning to DC. I live in Brooklyn. I could have left my house at 6 a.m. to go to LaGuardia, to get on the shuttle, huh? land over at, at Reagan National, and come on over here. But what I usually do is, living in Brooklyn, I walk a block to the F train, take the F over to Borough Hall, you know, and I left this morning at 7.15, okay, so an hour and 15 minutes yeah. later than I would have had to leave because of this whole string of difficulty in getting to LaGuardia on the, B on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway, the $5 billion of construction at LaGuardia, what, what, what meets me there at that particular point, are they moving equipment, and so the road stops for a few minutes, but I could get to Borough Hall, look at my MTA app, and say, oh, well, the A's going to come in. I can go to the A, stay on the F to 34th Street, and walk over. You know, and I was still there in 25 minutes. Got on the 8 a.m. Acela, and was here at 1054, and came on over. So there's a greater reliability factor built into inner city rail that sometimes, depending on weather, depending on construction conditions, or the congestion on getting to that airport, you do not have to confront by going to a downtown station and having that reliability, whether it's coming here or DC, Boston, you know, it's downtown to downtown. How do you commercialize those benefits? Or monetize those benefits? How do you benefit? Well, there's only one enterprise in the world, commuter, that runs with no subsidy, and that's Hong Kong, because Hong Kong Rail owns all the right of way. So all the real estate and development. Real estate. Right. along the commuter and subway system in Hong Kong pays a fee to utilize that. So that's a monetization of a value, right? You've created value through this rail, through the movement of people, right? Every day in the city of New York, we have six plus million on our subway system and almost a million and six now on the buses, but there's very little value back right, because of that value that's embedded in those tunnels that gets, you know, a 1.5 million resident population to about 7 million during the daytime periods. Mm -hmm. There's very little value coming back. We have time for like three very quick questions, short questions in, from the audience uh, in order to describe Andy. Hi, Andy, Andy Kunz, U.S. High Speed Rail Association. Um, John, I'm curious if there was another NTV available to purchase, would you be right on that one too? Uh, <laughs> similar condition, similar situation. Yeah. So, so the conundrum is we have companies like you who are ready to buy these and run them profitably. The conundrum is there; it's too hard to get them built to get the pipeline of these going. And so now Fortress has entered the picture, and and um, the uh, Japanese one in Texas. Uh, how do we speed up that side of the program, the building of these systems, so that there can be more of them available for companies like you to come and purchase? Um, and, and the other question is, 
you were saying earlier um, that the risk is just too high building them from scratch. Is, does the real estate component mitigate that? Because that's what Texas and Florida are both doing. That sort of changes the, the financial picture that maybe there can be a private company building these from scratch. Well, yes, it depends on how you get that real estate. Sometimes it's, you know, sometimes you can consider, like in Hong Kong, it was effectively a subsidy, mm -hmm. right? Here you get the real estate in the right away, right? Um, in, in, in practice, can it be? That's the test that's being put forth right now. It's, I think that it can work in the right city pairs as he's, he's put forward. Um, it's possible. But it's a it's it's unproven and it's a big risk and th and that's okay. I think that you know there are people who will take that that type of risk. the The issue is is at the moment, without it proven, people are waiting on the sidelines to see if it's if it's an attainable number to, to meet. And at the moment, we don't see that risk as viable. Let me put this into context, and I don't want anyone that's in the forecasting universe to throw anything at me. But <laughs> I've been on both continents done a lot of projects. One thing I find in the US around traffic forecasting, 90% of it's for roads and then they try to adopt for rail or some others, but mm -hmm. that's really what, the, there is a, a basic issue with, with the experience set of the forecasters in the US. The vast majority of them cater to the muni market. So if you miss a bit, it typically doesn't turn over those bonds it's not the same level of scrutiny that you tend to get when people are taking equity risk, right? So the basis of evaluation may not be as strong as it needs to be in order for people to take these bigger and bigger bets, even at the city level, right? Around how big is the traffic gonna be? What are they willing to pay, right? I'm of our business model at the moment, other than Eurostar, our business model at the moment believes that you need to undercut air and be competitive with car mm -hmm. as a price unit on a per person basis, mm -hmm. where if you're bringing multiple people, you could save money by driving versus rail, but it's close enough that that decision gets made in favor of rail potentially, right? <laughs> All of those dynamics need it to be is. put in place. Can land help out? Yeah, it can help out, but it's still a big punt, and I'm not sure all the tools are in place of all the different industries that support it are there. When one proves it, I think it'll come together, come together quickly, but it's still not there. I, I, I would just add two things to what John said to your, to your comment. Transit-oriented development absolutely is a factor. Um, it It's a certainly helping Brightline, and, um, and it's a component with respect to Texas Central, um, I suspect, as well. Um, the issue is it's not going to get it, you maybe. all the way to the finish line. Yeah. You have to really think about um, the capital um, challenge as really a layer cake, where you're putting in different pieces in effect to get there. And it, it is a, absolutely a viable chunk. And it also can be a viable chunk with respect to buying down some of the operating cost. The other comment I would just make is with respect to pro forma, um, you know, we, we've had a lot of experience relative to rail in the United States on traffic studies. And the early traffic studies were very, very difficult. A lot of money was lost. We've come a very, very long way in terms of the um, technology that, that has gone beyond that to the point now where we're able to forecast relatively successfully even something like managed lanes, which I would argue is almost you know, a greenfield road on steroids to some extent with all of the dynamic pricing elements and time of day issues associated with that. So rail has a ways to go. So let me just add, if yeah. you look at the initial bonds that were sold for Brightline, the real property of the three stations is not pledged to the bondholders. It's separate. Mm -hmm. Just the revenues of the operations right. is, is pledged. And if you look at the Virgin IPO, the preliminary that was issued last week, mm -hmm. it, in big letters it says none of the real property revenues were pledged. So they're not getting the benefit. You, the bondholder or an equity participant in Virgin, if it is issued, is just taking the fare box. That's it. That's all they get it. Not the real property. Hmm. Fortress has that in a separate corporate entity. Yep. Hmm. Okay. You'd have to do have to do what you want to do. Yeah. But what you really need to do is what Eisenhower did, right? Convince a nation that this is a national need and you need some, you know, ongoing level of subsidy. As John said, he'd be willing sure. to operate 
if Peter had 40 billion to put into the Northeast Corridor, mm -hmm. which clearly, since the FAST Act separated the Northeast Corridor out, you can see how valuable it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Hi, I'm Al Engel, and um, I was really intrigued when I saw the story on the Italo uh, deal and wanted to really get you on the panel. Thank you, John, for coming, and thanks to all the speakers. Uh, the last big high-speed rail transaction was HS1, I think. I don't know if you went after that one. High-speed rail is normally described as a totally integrated system from the sub-base up to the catenary, et cetera. Um, you've bought half a system, right? You bought the above the rail. So my question really is, in terms of risk management, what kind of control do you have over the, the operating environment? And you do have a, another operator on that system, the Italian railway, right? Yeah. So, so, so that, that, I mean, that's critical to the way we, we think about this investment. It took a long while for that to be put in place, but there's a regulatory framework for slotting, station access, timing. We need, we're on a par for bidding for a piece, you know, we want the 8 a.m. slot rather than the 8.30 slot to get you to mm -hmm. your meeting. That type of thing is under a framework agreement. It's not even a framework agreement. It's a regulatory framework in a separate entity that manages that at an arm's length basis from my competitor. My competitor is treated as if we're two competing for the same traffic of, of passengers. So now, like, do you have, like, what kind of, how much budget or what kind of resources do you actually allocate to over to do the oversight for that to make sure that you're getting what you what your expectation is to operate the service? I mean, do you do you have an you must have an oversight function? The government's the, the government's the oversight. Okay, function. you depend on the government. Okay. Yeah, no, so we, what we ask for, we get and we pay for. So it's, 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 it's no different than, there's a long history of, of operating passenger transportation in Europe. So there's a lot of framework mm -hmm. agreements and regulations too. I need to make sure my bus or my train is X level of cleanliness or so on and so forth. In exchange, I should expect from government. If that doesn't meet, it's, if we're, we don't meet, our train isn't let out at the right time or the other trains blocking mm -hmm. ours, we have a set of recourse. But it's all laid out in a regulatory framework okay. that we're very comfortable Thanks. with. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And that took a long time for them to get there. That doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. All right, I'll, I'll keep it quick. Yes, so last uh, question. Um, earlier, there was an, an assertion I just want to um, refine. Um, with respect to the first Shinkansen that was built in Japan, it was actually financed entirely with, with debt, with combination of Federal federal loan from Tokyo, and uh, and with bonds, there was no grant to build the Tokaido Shinkansen. So that's a little bit of a misconception. All all of the debt was paid back at low interest and over long term. Um, so, thinking about some of the projects that we've got going on in the U.S. today, I think Texas really stands out as the unique beast um, because they are looking to have a return on their capital expense. Right, okay. so. Ron, particularly, how does it stand apart a little bit from some of these other these other projects from Brightline or from um, uh, an E to Low? I mean, it, it, it is it just that what we talked about earlier, the circumstances such that you can do the capital for cheaper than other instances, or we just think that the market's there that you could actually make TCR work out? Peter, from what I understand of the project. Uh, I would say uh, the differences. The differences are number one is totally greenfield, right? I mean, as John said, fortuitously, Florida East Coast Industries had the freight line. Has to be upgraded, clearly, uh, be able to you know carry passengers, and, uh, and as you mentioned, northern sections will even be at a higher speed, right? So it's going to be new construction, but um, you know everything that Texas Central might be able to do in the future, right? Because it's still an idea, it doesn't operate, uh, is gonna be based upon some combination of equity and debt, right? Where they are gonna have to hit the hurdles that John's, because no equity participant is going to enter into a investment that they think is at risk 
because whether it's the Canadian pension funds, the European pension funds, the Australian pension funds, they have a fiduciary responsibility to those workers to make sure their, their pensions are funded. They can't do crazy things, OK? <laughs> Nor can you on the debt side. It's got to be a sound investment. And so that's why I began by talking about what would be required fundamentally for an investor, whether it's equity or debt, to look at these core essentials. If those strong city pairs aren't there, if the congestion isn't there, if the pricing of those tickets cannot compete with other modes, it's not working, and they're not getting, they're not putting their money in on any side, debt or equity, and the federal government shouldn't, and you wouldn't, because you would take a strong look at it and use your financial advisors. Mr. DePrincio was one of your advisors at one point, and you would do the analytics to be sure on a forecast, because it's a, not an existing enterprise, it's all forecasted, that there's a good possibility that the federal government's going to get paid back. Right? So it's got to be a very, very airtight feasibility study, a strong design-build contract with very experienced contractors, someone to do the O&M who has experience, right? Probably there's no one in the U.S. that could do it, so it's probably got to come from Europe or Asia. And you've got to put together, assemble that kind of team that can convince whether it's Canadian, Australian, pension funds, European pension funds, European insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds in the Middle East, that this is a sound investment. And similarly, whether it's U.S. bondholders or the United States government, that type of analysis has to take place. Yeah, the, the, the jury is still out. I mean, we don't really know right. what the financial layer cake looks like for TCR. Um, <clears throat> I think the when we... When we're all saying it's a greenfield project, I think it's pretty important that everybody understands um, it. Um, th there's a there's a certain inherent inherent advantage to that alignment. A long time ago, I was at a TRB conference, and um, the, one of the original uh, members of the development team talked about the fact that it has the best chance of succeeding Texas Central um, because there's no water and it doesn't have any mountains. It's flat. <laughs> and it's absolutely true. I mean, in effect, that the, the cost of that alignment, you know, maybe not exactly like um, Brightline, um, but it, the cost of that alignment is going to be relatively low compared to other projects that um, would be going up against, you know, a, a financial uh, test, so to speak. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that equity return and that debt service, it, it, it has to work very much, you know, as, as Ron is saying, along the lines of, of uh, you know, what a pro forma will ultimately lay out and what a pension fund investor or a proxy as GIP is for pension funds, you know, is ultimately going to look at. I mean, it, it, it's, it's informative. If you take a moment and you, you look back at one of these projects, break it down to units and think about what is the cost per each mile that you're building and how much yield you have to get back from that, which translates into how many passengers and what pa price has to be paid for that to back. And it's not hard math. I mean, th there's guys in my office that, that do this every day in, in half a day, an hour, right? It's, it's not hard math. Where, where most of this breaks down is you start to really stretch yourself on the price that people you believe people are going to pay or how many people are actually going to do that. And when you start to do that to make your, your project make sense, that's when the investment universe is going to get nervous and start really putting time into it. You know, I'll spend three, four, five million dollars just investigating an investment, right? So we're going to spend real time to do it. I don't know what's going to happen in Texas, but at the moment, it's the jury's out. I, I just, you know, maybe it works. Well, I certainly want to thank our panelists. I think we could go on a very long time here. Uh, thank you, Ron, John, and, and Ray. Thank you.